We're really delighted to have uh, Susan Faludi uh, uh, with us this evening. You know, some of uh, Susan's best writing over the years has been, of, of course, on, on gender issues, uh, starting with her, her coverage of feminism as a journalist in the, in the 1980s. Uh, her 1991 award-winning book, uh, Backlash, remains uh, an important uh, reassertion of, of feminist uh, tenets. Uh, and a later book, Stift, in 1999, assessed the state of, of American manhood. Uh, her new book, In the Dark Room, uh, is her most personal, uh, and very in intensely so. At the center is the remarkable tale of her father, uh, from whom she was estranged for many years, and who dared her to, quote, write my story after disclosing in 2004 that at the age of 76, he had undergone gender reassignment surgery. Her dad proved to be a, a massive jigsaw puzzle for her, and digging into the past was, uh, was quite challenging. Uh, my most difficult repertorial subject is how uh, Susan described her dad in, uh, in a recent interview. Uh, but the book is, a, is, is about more than, uh, than her father's metamorphosis or, or more than an inquiry into the meaning of gender. Uh, it is it is those things, but it's it's also a very moving, provocative, and multi-layered examination of, of identity, uh, whether identity in the name of truer truer self-expression, or more darkly, uh, in the interest of nationalism or, or xenophobia. Maureen Corrigan, reviewing the book for National Public Radio, called it especially pertinent reading in quote our own dark times when questions of identity keep coming to the fore as, as matters of life and death. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Susan Faludi. Can you all hear me? Yes. Good. <laughs> Thank you for that. That was a wonderful description. I've, I've read some really odd descriptions in my book that actually encapsulated it. Um, you know, last time um, I was here uh, was, I think, for my third book, uh, The Terror Dream, and it was 2007, and, and this book was well underway by then. Uh, and I remember thinking, as hard as it is uh, to go against the culture on matters of national security, uh, it would be way more terrifying to be up here holding forth about my relationship with my father. So uh, here I am now. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Um, I'm also very glad to see some dear friends here who've been kind enough to put up with my long reluctance to go into what I've been working on for the last decade. Uh, so thank you for your tolerance. It's really great to see you here. Um, I thought I'd start out where my book starts out uh, with an email I received from my father 12 years ago. It began to Susan C. Faludi, date 7-7-2004, subject changes. Dear Susan, I've got some interesting news for you. I have decided that I have had enough of impersonating a macho aggressive man that I've never been inside. Now, uh, attached to this message was a series of snapshots. Uh, in the first, my father is standing in a hospital lobby in a sheer sleeveless chemise and red skirt. And the caption read, I look tired after the surgery. In another, um, taken some months before the surgery, my father is perched amid a copse of trees, uh, modeling a henna wig with bangs and a ruffled blouse. The caption read, Stephanie in Vienna Garden. Okay, so that's the email I got. Naturally, this surprised me. Um, also, understand when my father flew to Thailand to get gender reassignment surgery, she was 76 years old. And on top of that, um, we had been pretty much alienated from each other. Um, my father and I had barely spoken in a quarter century. Truth be told, we never had a very good relationship. Uh, when I was growing up, my father was, 
as she described it, aggressive, also autocratic, domineering, um, and even violent, as I relate in the book. All of which fueled my early feminism. Now, um, some of you know my previous work, and you know that I write about political and public issues and not so much personal stuff. So this is a big departure for me um, and a bit of a scary one, but it was also what my father wanted. Uh, in the phone call that followed the email, my father in said, why don't you come over here and um, basically interview me and recount my story. Uh, so that was the beginning of this project. Uh, so a couple of months after the email, I jumped on a plane to Hungary, which was where my father was living. Um, in 1990, my father had returned to the country where she had grown up. On this first visit and subsequent ones, um, we pursued the process of getting to know each other again. Um, for me, probably the least difficult part of that journey was coming to accept my father as a woman. Far harder was dealing with all the ghosts that haunted both of us from our past. Um, and clearly my father's identity quest, which had culminated in her surgery, um, was intertwined with many other aspects of her life. So apropos that, uh, I want to read first an excerpt that suggests how her life as a woman was entwined with her life as a father. You still can, you can hear me from this angle? Okay. <laughs> Can't really see you over the uh, microphone. Maybe I'll pull it down a little. My father broke into a run, pounding across the plaza to the entrance of a 10-story commercial building a few blocks from the Danube on the Buddha side of the river, skirt rustling, black pumps clacking on the concrete. She jammed a leg in the glass door just as it was closing behind a mail carrier. We had arrived at her doctor's office. They lock the entrance, she called over her shoulder. Come on. We took the elevator to an upper floor in a waiting area at the end of a long, tatty, um, it, I'm sorry, we took the elevator to an upper, upper floor in a waiting area at the end of a long, tatty corridor, two sagging vinyl couches were pushed up against opposing walls. The scruffy carpet was balding and matched the mud color of the couches. A line of baby photos was thumbtacked to one wall. Don't you want one of these? My father was pointing at the baby pictures. I pretended not to hear and studied the large plaque to the right of them. Dr. Andre Measley, Obstetrics and Gynecology. The inner door swung open before she could ask me again. A very tan and silver-haired gent in an Izod shirt and doctor's smock greeted us. Keze Chokolom, he said to me. Uh, this is the old-fashioned Hungarian greeting from a man to a woman. It means, I kiss your hand. And then, turning to my father, Kese Chokolom. My father grinned and gave me a nudge. We followed the gynecologist into his consulting room, a small space with a cluttered desk and a credenza lined with sports trophies. My father settled her pocketbook on her lap and began chatting away in Hungarian. The bronze Dr. Measley beamed and nodded affably. After a while, he made some notes on a prescription pad, tore out the sheet, and handed it to my father, a refill for her estrogen. My father deposited the slip in her purse. I was just telling Dr. Measley, my father said, turning to me, that I am the mother of you, she made air quotes with her fingers. Who, my father added, is not a mother. Who, I said. You. Not yet, anyway. How did he get these trophies, I asked. I was changing the subject. Dr. Measley is a great yachtsman, my father exclaimed, explained. He has a 20-foot boat, and he's won many prizes. She translated her flattery to Captain Measley, who beamed some more. They carried on for a while, my father pointing a finger at me from time to time. I, I should note here that I do not, despite a year of Hungarian lessons, um, can you know, say hello, goodbye, and can I have a glass of wine, and that's about it. 
Um, also, sometimes two glasses of wine, <laughs> depending on the day my father and I had. Um, they carried on for a while, my father pointing a finger at me from time to time. I'm telling him about your problem, my father said. Problem? There may be physical reasons. There are no... Dr. Measley put away his prescription pad. I pulled out my reporter's notebook. Can I ask a few questions, I said. Dr. Measley indicated through my father that he was amenable. Do you see a difference since the operation? The doctor dawdled with his answer. He says my face is very nice now, my father translated. He says I have very few wrinkles for a man my age. <laughs> what I meant, I said, was does Dr. Measley see a difference in your personality? The reply was longer in coming. Dr. Measley says that I'm a happy man, my father related. A happy person, she corrected herself. Dr. Measley says this is very important because we don't know how many years a life brings, but at least a person must live it in happiness. Dr. Measley, I thought, dispenses platitudes as well as pharmaceuticals. <laughs> is my father one of your more, I turned over adjectives in my mind, unusual patients? The answer came back through the linguistic bucket brigade. He says he has one even more unusual, my father said. He brought into the world a girl who was 12 years old. <laughs> this did sound unusual. The patient was 12 years old, my father amended. She came to the hospital and she didn't know she was pregnant. He had to cut open that thing. What thing? You know, where the vagina is. The hymen? Right. I still wasn't following. Sperm got smeared on her somehow, my father related. There was a little hole in the hymen. The sperm got in. Somehow? My father conferred again with the doctor. The girl got raped. My pen froze over my notepad. Another round of Hungarian. It was her father, my father said. Christ, I said. Dr. Measley beamed. Dr. Measley wants to know how old you are, my father said. 49, I said, and thought peevishly, don't you know? The two conferred. He says you look much younger, my father said. Like me, she added. And then after a few more minutes, Dr. Measley says that he once had a patient who had her first baby past 48. So this is your last chance. <laughs> Dr. Measley wants to know if you've tried fertility treatments. I don't. Dr. Measley says you should monitor your ovulation. The gynecologist reached into a drawer and pulled out a small plastic device shaped like a kazoo. <laughs> you spit into it, my father translated, and it tells you on the days you are impregnable. It <laughs> impregnable? Whether you can have a baby, my, f my father elbowed me. Okay, dear, he says, now he can do the exam. No thanks, I said, but he's got free time. <laughs> I don't want an exam. You want to come back? No, I, the doctor reached into his desk and handed me a flyer, an advertisement for mini microsoap, the ovulation monitor. On the front, in girlish pink script and in English, it said, Maybe, baby. <laughs> it will only take 10 minutes, my father said. No! My father snatched up her purse and headed for the door, her face contracting into a familiar scowl. We rode the elevator in silence. Downstairs, we stopped at the pharmacy. She had to pick up her hormones and found our place at the end of a long queue. I could feel my father appraising me. This business of no children, she said, it's not normal. When the prescription was finally ready, my father snatched it from the counter and flung herself through the door. I had to hurry not to lose her as she clacked furiously down a warren of back streets, her white pocketbook swinging like a mainsail from the gaff of a bunched shoulder. At one point, she disappeared around a corner, and I was overcome with a childlike terror of being lost. I caught sight of the flapping purse again as we reached Moskvater, the city's huge transport junction still bearing then its communist era name. 
I followed at my father's heels as she crossed several sets of railroad tracks and came to rest on the platform for the number 59. Some minutes into our wait, my father broke the silence. Everything reproduces, she said. Birds, bees, even these little weeds in the ground. She gestured toward a tuft of crabgrass pushing through a crack in the pavement. I looked down the tracks, willing the tram to come. Without children, your existence has no meaning, my father said. And, when I didn't answer, your books will stop selling. People will forget all about what you wrote. I kept my eyes on the rails. It's the most important thing, she said. I turned to face her. Family, she finished. If family meant so much, I thought and didn't say, why had she cut herself off from the one she was born into and the one she had sired? Wasn't she still cutting herself off? I'm Steffi now, she liked to say. From her whole fraught history as a troubled son, an embattled husband and father, but what if something else was going on? My daughter likes me now, my father had told her new trans friends at the party she hosted in my honor. She comes to see me. I thought of the headline in the article in Mashok magazine, Stefania Achalad Apa, which means Stefania the father. An ear-piercing screech of metal wheels announced the approach of the tram. My father fixed a sharp eye on me. You are ending the family, she said. When a family gets discontinued, it's suicide. For all these people who lived, all these people who came before you. She wasn't wrong, I thought. I had denied her family. Not just by failing to have children, but by letting our estrangement drag on for so many years. It was the latter that caused me shame. So um, to come to grips with my father's story, I had to confront a whole series of questions about identity. And ultimately, I had to ask myself, well, what is identity anyway? Is identity what we choose to be? Or is it the very thing that we can't escape? Um, for my father's part, my father grew up Jewish, then named Ishvan Friedman. Uh, an only child of wealthy parents in Budapest, uh, and lived a life of privilege until World War II when large numbers of our family would perish in the Holocaust. Uh, my teenage father survived um, by his wits on the streets of Budapest, passing as Christian uh, with a fal uh, false identity papers and a stolen fascist armband. Uh, one time he would use this armband to pose as a Hungarian uh, Nazi Arrow Cross officer to rescue his parents from a protected house um, whose residents were about to be killed. And this is one of the stories I tell in the book. Um, after the war, my father would go on to other identity reinventions, uh, documentary photographer and filmmaker in the Brazilian outback, uh, all-American commuter dad in Westchester County, uh, muscular sportsman and mountaineer and rock climber, um, and high-end commercial photographer in Manhattan, uh, where his specialty was altering images. Uh, trick photography, my father called it. And then when my father returned to Hungary after the fall of communism, another remake as a quote-unquote 100% Hungarian patriot, uh, a die-hard supporter of the current right-wing regime. Uh, I came to think of my father as a kind of identity zealot, you know, channeling the last century's biggest marquee struggles over identity. People often see identity as singular um, and stable, but what I saw with my father was an identity that was multiple and fluid uh, and had, me had many threads. So uh, the next excerpt I want to read you explores the conjunction of two of these many threads, uh, gender and religion. Okay. 
I love this place, my father declared. It's authentic Hungarian. We were waiting for a table at the Fish Farm Inn close to the Danube, where my father liked to order the Halisley, a traditional spicy fish soup larded with enough paprika to burn out your brain on the first sip. My father especially loved the old school waiters, elderly gents with formal manners, greeting her with courtly gallantry and pulling out her chair, addressing her with that vintage salutation of men to women, kese, chocolum. I kiss your hand. Did they find her womanly? As usual, she wasn't wearing a wig. Her white purse was slung like a sailor's duffel over her blue double-breasted captain's jacket, an ocean-faring motif for a seafood dinner. When the late waiter left the table, I remarked on his deference. Well, they have to kiss my hand now. Why, I said. Because, she said, I'm tough. I decided to exercise some toughness of my own. I announced I was foregoing the fish soup. It's made the correct way here, my father insisted, and proceeded to wear me down with one of her characteristic free-floating filibusters. <laughs> Hallisley should only be made with river fish or lake fish, but never salt water. It can be carp, perch, catfish. Now, Lake Balaton's the largest freshwater lake, and I said I'd try the soup. The waiter arrived with a cast iron kettle and began ladling out its contents, starting with my father's bowl. Ladies first, my father quipped. She looked pleased with her own sophistry, a trickster mocking and simultaneously enforcing convention. Lake Balatone, she said after a while. That's how we ended up hearing it on the radio. A conversation with her was like a ride in a run amuck submersible. One minute you were bobbing on the surface, the next trawling the ocean floor. Now she was back in the summer of 1944 when my fugitive father and grandfather hid in a doctor's apartment while the doctor holidayed at Lake Balatone. Father and son had listened very quietly to the BBC. That's how we heard the Germans had taken away the Jews of Kasha, she said now. She was referring to my grandfather's hometown. My father started to cry, she said. He told me they have killed my parents. Did he try to get his parents out, I asked. My father studied the tablecloth and said nothing. You did something, I said. You saved your parents. That was different, my father said. I believed it, so they believed it. Um, by they, my father was referring to the Hungarian Arrow Cross who were guarding the building uh, where my grandparents were, were held. I took part in their game, my father said. If you believe you are whoever you pretend to be, you're halfway saved. But if you act funny, if you act afraid, you're halfway to the gas chamber. My father ordered dessert, pureed chestnuts laced with rum and vanilla, heaped with whipped cream, and served in a gigantic goblet. My father was a lifelong, um, had a lifelong sweet tooth, and always at four in the afternoon, we would have to have like a, uh, some kind of Viennese tort and uh, espresso, which never seemed to keep, keep him from sleeping. Um, uh, this role-playing during the war, she said, as she tackled the towering confec confection, that was a similar process. Similar to what, I said. I can sit down with anyone now, and he kisses my hand, she said. It strengthened me for life that I did these things back then and that I could get away with it. So now I can do this other thing, meaning her change in sex. Because if you are convinced you are this other person, everybody else will be convinced. So what you're doing now, I ask, is that playing another role too? I was role playing as a man, she said, but I wasn't totally accepted by women as a capital letter M man. I didn't have the wherewithal. Now as a woman, I'm not role playing anymore. Because this is who you were all along, I asked. Well, it's who I am now, she said. Since the operation, I have developed another personality. 
Which has been easier for you, I asked, to be accepted as a woman after being born a man or to be accepted as a Hungarian after being born a Jew? My father thought about it, holding her spoon before her like a hand mirror. As a woman, she said, because I am a woman, with a birth certificate that says I'm a woman, so I must be a woman. My father polished off her dessert. So, she said, is the Inquisition over now? She grinned and waved her spoon. The lives and crimes of Stephanie Faludi. Oh, my God. We, filled out, we filed out into the night air. The Danube lay before us, obsidian in darkness. My father tugged at my sleeve. Getting away with it, she said. Susan, don't forget that line. That's the key to it all. Because a lot of people got discovered that they were Jewish and they were shot. Um, so my father obviously conflated in her mind her different struggles with identity, um, but those struggles weren't just in the past and they weren't just personal. Um, by the time I was visiting my father, Hungary was going through its own identity crisis, um, one that has unfortunately led it to the brink of resurgent anti-Semitism and authoritarianism. Um, and it's a big part of the book that I'm sorry to discover is even more relevant than I knew when I wrote it, uh, considering the recent horrific events in Orlando, um, but, and also considering the larger current political climate here in the United States. Um, part of what my book explores is the way that identity can be either liberating, as with LGBT rights, um, or can be nationalistic uh, xenophobic, uh, in some cases, downright fascist. Um, and I, I thought I'd close with an excerpt that shows these two forms of identity colliding. Are you going to be in the parade, I asked. We were washing dishes in my father's kitchen. My father took her time, drying her hands on her frilled yellow apron. No. Why not, I asked. We were talking about the one annual public showing of Hungary's LGBT population, the Budapest Gay Dignity Procession. The parade was scheduled for July 5th, a few weeks hence. I did it once, my father said. So? So I don't need to do it again. It's boring. I didn't buy that. The Grand Dame of the Gay Parade, she'd exulted two years earlier after the 2006 march. Well, she'd added, old dame, anyway. She'd sent me pictures she'd taken with young revelers, and she, sh she couldn't stop talking about it. It's the signature event of the LGBT community, I said. Don't you want to be there? She gave her signature wave of dismissal. It's an irritant. Some of the transes don't, don't dress tastefully, you know? <laughs> I didn't know, but I knew enough about the parade's reception to be secretly relieved she was planning on missing it. My father stacked the plates in the cupboard. She wiped down the counters slowly and took her time folding the, the matching yellow floral dish towels. Then she met my eye. There could be trouble, she said. The previous year, right-wing thugs had attacked the paraders as they marched down Andrashi Boulevard and beat up revelers at the after party at Buda Beach, two so severely that they had to be hospitalized. The police were conspicuously absent. When a parade member called the police, she was told that having chosen to participate in the march, she, quote, should take its consequences. On the streets of Budapest that day, two assertions of identity had collided with bloody consequences for one of them. In the weeks leading up to this year's procession, the signs were even more ominous. The Hungarian right-wing media and blogosphere were roiling with fury. The, the communique issued by the rightist Hunia organization was typical. We will not permit aberrant foreigners of this or that color to force their alien and sick world on Hungary. We hereby publicly declare that we ourselves will defend the Hungarian capital. 
Yobik uh, parliamentary members attempted to ban the parade and later introduced legislation to make the, quote, promotion of sexual deviations, including homosexuality, transsexuality, transvestism, bisexuality, and pedophile behaviors, unquote, punishable by up to eight years in prison. In June, the far right website Kuruk posted the names and addresses of LGBT gathering spots in Budapest. A few days later, a gay bar and bathhouse, both on the website's list, were firebombed. Kuruk hailed the attacks in a post titled, post titled quote, Cleansing Fire Licks Another Mini Sodom. By then, more than a dozen Hungarian far-right groups were mobilizing against the march. The Hungarian self-defense movement announced its intent to attack their parade and appealed to, quote, all Hungarians to expel the pederast horde once and for all. A soccer fan club promised to meet the marchers with, quote, weapons if we must, with bare hands if we must, but we will not let things stand as they are. The opening ceremonies of the 2008 Gay Pride Festival were held in a downtown theater. The former equality minister, Catalin Levoyi, delivered the keynote speech. She talked about the rights and the desires of LGBT, LGBT people to build a community by making their identity public. A community, she said, may only find dignity if it becomes visible. But the threats convinced many, like my father, to stay home. The day of the gay dignity procession, bands of self-styled Hungarian patriots broke through the police barricades and hurled smoke bombs, firecrackers, cobblestones, bottles, acid-filled eggs, rotting food, and feces. They accosted parade goers and policemen alike beat up a well-known liberal radio reporter and attacked a Roma performer so viciously that the march's concert had to be canceled. They slapped and spat at a socialist politician who was on record as supporting the march and smashed the windows of the car, carrying the former equality minister and the first openly gay government official. Marchers fled through an underground tunnel to the nearest subway station. In the course of the dignity procession, the predictable epithets were hurled. Dirty queers, filthy fags, and so on. One particular chant, though, seemed to capture the crowd's fancy. It was heard all along the parade route. Buzakat a duna bo zidokat meg utano. Faggots into the Danube, followed by the Jews. So um, on that not very cheerful note, um, I think I'll stop and hear your thoughts and, and questions. Oh. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so I think we have microphones. I thought you were going to be the brave soul. Oh, you Hi. are. Good. <laughs> uh, hi, my name is James. I'm, actually, I'm very curious what your opinion is. Um, I sort of came in midway through the talk, so I'm not sure if this sort of fits within the context of what your um, talk is about. But I'm very curious about what your opinion is about left-wing feminists or feminists in general who align themselves um, with the right on specific issues or certain issues, those being uh, the ones that come to my mind right off the top of my head being Camille Paglia, Tammy Bruce, or of course Andrea Dworkin, probably the most famous example of that. I'm very curious what your opinion is about uh, feminists like that, and if you've what, if you've had interactions with those uh, feminists, and what your opinion, um, what those interactions were in general. Um, well, I actually never had the privilege of meeting Andrea Dworkin. I, I wish I had, and some of you may know she um, died a few years ago. Uh, Camille Paglia, I have had encounters with. Yeah. I'm not sure I would call her a feminist. Right. <laughs> um, that she, or at least I will say that right. her feminism and my feminism right. don't have, you know, yeah. much yeah. common ground. Um, uh, uh, and Tammy Bruce, I think I met once many years ago. Um, but 
I'm not quite sure how to answer your, your question. I'm, um, you know, uh, feminism has sort of multiplied into feminisms. Um, uh, my feminism, uh, which is uh, all I can probably speak for, is, uh, is uh, one uh, in which uh, I believe that um, in, re in relevance to this, what we're discussing. That's right. Tonight, which Sorry. is uh, oh no, it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> the uh, uh, question of transgender, I, I think, is actually um, very much in accord with uh, this uh, new generation or contemporary generation of um, trans theorists, and that I believe gender is uh, uh, a fluid commodity. Um, I, and that uh, it's a good thing to challenge the gender binary. Um, and I'm not sure how Camille Paglia comes down on that, but I'm sure we will hear. I know we, as a lesbian, we always yeah, hear. I know as Camille Paglia's identity as a lesbian is interesting in that she's recently come out very much against sort of the gay rights agenda or the gay identity mm -hmm. agenda. And it's an interesting shift that she identifies as a lesbian in that sense proudly, but also is very vocal in denouncing many parts of the gay rights agenda. Mm -hmm. I find that very, uh, mm -hmm. an interesting binary there. Yeah, well, it's, uh, I guess, sort of like her calling herself a feminist and then denouncing feminists, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. So yeah, she, she's provocative. I think yeah. that's her main consistent. Yeah. Well, thank you. Appreciate sure. it. So um, as you got to know your father, did you discover more feminine qualities in him after the surgery, and then did you sort of looking back, did you see those qualities when he was a man? Mm. Thank you, Th that's a good question. I'm, you know, my father, um, my father wasn't, my father wasn't particularly feminine in, you know, whatever that means. Um, uh, when I was growing up, um, but you know, looking back, I think my the my father was trying on many kind of masks and identities and roles, um, and was really you know has sort of uh, adopted a very hyper masculine uh, persona. Um, uh, and looking back, it seemed to me that you know that in fact, was a way of, of pushing out uh, deeper feelings. Um, at the same time, right, I mean, leading up to the operation and right um, in the year or so after the operation, my father um, embraced a, a rather, to my mind, cliched kind of 1950s girly, girly femininity that seemed straight out of, you know, a Marilyn Monroe movie. Um, and I and I, I began to, you know, later realize that perhaps uh, my father needed to go to that ex you know extreme of hyper femininity to sort of break out of the carapace of extreme masculinity. Um, so she had, <laughs> had to hammer through many um, layers that she had imposed on herself, um, and later. And uh, you know, in in the last years of her life, my father became much more sort of comfortable with who she was, in ways that didn't have so much to do with the gender. I mean, sort of put that down as something that had to be projected out in the world, um, and I would like to think became more herself, which is what we all want ultimately. Um. So, I believe I read this in a review of your book. I don't know that it's in the book, but it was uh, uh, a remark about an interview with the doctor doing this gender reassignment surgery who claimed that, uh, who was asked uh, how happy are the people uh, after the surgery. And he said, well, out of 100, maybe six or eight. Oh, yeah, that, that's not a doctor, but go ahead. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. I c couldn't remember, but I wondered about your comments about that 
both generally, but uh, in relation to your father. Yeah, you know that um, that was actually um, uh, 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 well, Melanie Myers, who then became well, who started out as Mel, became Melanie Myers, and then went back to being a man. Um, and Mel, as he wound up, um, uh, ran uh, this um, sort of recovery um, house, sort of guest house in Thailand that for, um, for post-op um, uh, transsexuals who you know needed to recover before they could get back on the plane. It was called Melanie's Cocoon, and my father spent quite a bit of time there. Um, and so I, and it just so happened, uh, Melanie, who then became Mel, um, spent half the year in Thailand and half the year um, in uh, Portland, Oregon, where I was living at the time. So we got to know each other and became friends. And uh, what uh, Mel was saying there was actually not that, oh, people regret it, because in fact, mo I mean, most of I mean, the studies of and sur or studies or surveys of, of people who, who've um, had gender reassignment surgeries, the majority of them don't regret it. Um, and it, what, what Mel was saying was that it's very hard to pass. And um, he felt that out of, you know, out of 100, only a very few um, can, can pull it off in a way that makes them feel comfortable. Um, and I think Mel was, main, you know, was mainly talking about himself and mm -hmm. some of the other people he knew who really suffered for, you know, feeling that they weren't accepted. I have to say, for my father, my father never expressed any regret, um, and I think was completely comfortable with, you know, that was maybe one of the few decisions my father <laughs> made that that um, was, she could live with. Mm -hmm. And she was accepted. Uh, well, you know, I think because my father has this sort of brazen, you know, um, I mean, of all the places to pick uh, <laughs> to be trans, Hungary would not be on the top of my list, you know. Um, and we did at the beginning have this experience where we'd be, we'd be walking um, through Budapest and um, there were these, you know, sort of very disapproving, um, you know, sort of elderly, matronly, women who would sort of glower. But after a while, I realized that they did a lot of glower. They would glower at me. <laughs> I, mean, I, so I was never sure. Um, and you know, my father, I think the thing that was most wonderful is my, my father had a lifelong struggle to just connect with other people. And the one thing that she talked about a lot was that uh, you know, after the um, surgery, she felt that she could begin to um, communicate with people, um, and and particularly with women. And she, um, the, the several neighbors um, who were sort of keeping their distance before, because my father could be really explosive and just really really angry, um, became became um, um, you know close to friends with my father, and that was a that was a big leap forward. So thank you. Hi, I'm, I'm halfway through your book, and I'm truly astounded and amazed, and I think it's incredible that you're doing this. Thank you. Well, my question is, given what you've learned and what you've lived, do you have more questions now that your father has passed that are difficult or unable to be answered, or they're still becoming answerable as you go? That's a good question. I mean, I wake up in the middle of the night thinking, and, and often thinking, oh, I have to ask Stephanie. And I'm like, oh, no, I can't. I mean, my father died a year ago. Um, and, you know, there are lots of qu sort of specific questions, details. Um, and I wish, you know, and I w wish there were uh, one of, you know, the problems that anybody who's written about the Holocaust knows. I mean, we're at this period where everybody you want to talk to is like 90 something years old. Um, and in the course, just in the last year, there are um, a couple people in the book who've died. Um, so, you know, it's not just my father, but there are other people around my father that I wish I could have talked to. Uh, but I think they sort of, um, sort of the emotional core, I, I feel 
as much as my father could open up and, and let me in, she did. And, you know, I'm, I'm grateful for that. Well, thank so. you, yes. Uh, may I ask, uh, first of all, thank you for Backlash many, many years ago. It had Thanks. a great influence on, on my thinking, and I'm very grateful. Um, what I'm not hearing is anything about your mother. I can't imagine living with your father. And so I wonder where she was yeah. or well, is. My, my mother can't imagine living with my mother. She's still alive. <laughs> yes. Ah. Um, and, well, you know, um, I shared the manuscript with her, and she gave me her thoughts. But, um, you know, my, f my father asked me to write her story. My, you know, you know, my mother did not. And uh, my mother and my brother are private people, so I, I want to honor that privacy and and also I just I mean as a, I'm sure all of you have experienced with family we all have our singular yeah. responses and sometimes yeah. you think oh do, do I live in the same family as you do um, and so I, I I wouldn't want to presume to opine on on either my mother's experience or my brother's yeah. experience um, but uh, you know it's it's hard when it's hard on families when you yeah. <laughs> write a memoir or, or you just have a writer in the family and they've, <laughs> they've been very gracious and tolerant of all that. Hi. Yeah. Hi. Um, so I've been reading about uh, Martine Rothblatt lately. Um, I'm sorry? Martine Rothblatt, who's um, oh, right. a trans woman who uh, was Sirius like the founder of Sirius Radio. and yeah, the biotech yeah. firm. Um, and one thing that I found very interesting about her was that she stayed in her relationship. Um, and I guess maybe the age um, of your father's transition might mm. kind of uh, make this sort of not necessarily as relevant. But I was wondering whether your father's, uh, uh, whether her sexuality seemed different mm -hmm. um, afterwards, whether she still, uh, whether she was straight or was gay as a woman. Um, mm. And um, yeah, I mean, that's really what I was wondering. Good question. Yeah. Well, um, you know, it was interesting because my father always had this notion of, okay, I mean, there was a struggle between um, this is what's expected of me and this is what I have to do to be accepted. And so my father said, okay, well, now that I'm a woman, I, you know, have to be involved with a man. But then my father never got involved with a man and actually stayed close to the girlfriend that, um, that she had had for um, many years in in um, Budapest, and then later, you know, became close to another woman, and so I don't. Uh, but uh, and as you say, you know, at the age of seventy six, at some point, this became sort of a mood question anyway. But yeah, I don't think you know she, she as far as I n know, and my father was. Uh, 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 big proponent of TMI. I mean, there was very little that my father wouldn't tell me, so I imagine <laughs> that she would have told me. Um, uh, but that, yeah, she just uh, continued to be drawn to women, as far as I could tell. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, I wonder, um, through the process of your exploration in writing this book, whether you gained any insight into in the area of gender flu fluidity, why some feel compelled towards surgery and others do not? I, you know, I, this is one of those areas where as much as um, I did a lot of reading, um, you know, research the sort of history uh, of transsexuality and how it got diagnosed, um, and talked to a lot of trans authorities and trans activists, um, I used all that to bring, to illuminate my father's story. Um, but that's different from becoming an expert on, on uh, those sort of questions. I mean, I haven't, I haven't done, you know, scientific research. Um, so, yeah, I think I may take a pass on that. I, I only know, you know, that my father proceeded to this point. Um, and... You know, I mean, for some people, it's just a matter of whether they can afford it or not. For others, it's it's there's a desire to sort of live in a in a more liminal 
um, you know, middle space. I mean, the part of the appeal is that, okay, I'm not going to fit into these molds. Um, I think for some, perhaps for some much older people of my father's generation, you know, who grew up with, you've got to be one thing or another, there's more of, of a push toward that. Hi. Um, that, that, your last comment leads to the question that I have. Um, when you, in the last excerpt you read, um, y your father said, seemed to be not wanting to participate in this Gay Pride Day because mm -hmm. of uh, fear of uh, violence or something like that. But I wonder if there isn't also a kind of a cultural, a, a generational cultural divide. That is, I mean, he's, although he was obviously, he, she was a very idiosyncratic person, certainly mm -hmm. unique. But, but in the end, especially in the certain early phases of the transition, she seemed to be more kind of bourgeois in a certain way. Mm -hmm. And there's a way in which queer, in which transsexuals are part of queer culture, part of gay culture, that's sort of specific to a certain generation, mm -hmm. a certain set of politics, and so forth. And so I wonder if, um, if there was a way in which she felt kind of separate or alienated from the sort of mainstream of queer, if you can say such a thing, the mainstream of queer culture yeah. by her generation, by her, her Judaism, by her, you know, her biography, um, anything like that. Yeah. Yeah, well, and put on top of that, that she was in Hungary. Right, <laughs> which, right. right. Um, so at one point, um, and I talk about this in the book, my father has a um, party at her house to um, uh, introduce me to the trans community of Budapest. Um, and these were, um, and they were all trans women and one man who hadn't really, tra who identified as a transvestite. Um, but... Um, and some of the, and they except for the the one who identified as a transvestite they were all much younger um and yeah there you know there was that disconnect for one thing i mean politically my father was like oh you know the old hungary if we could only bring back the austro-hungarian empire and <laughs> that, that didn't go over very well with the youngsters um so, yeah, I mean, my father was cut off in so many other ways, too. Um, and, and you know, was so alone with this for so many years. I mean, completely alone. I mean, I didn't tell anyone, clearly no one in our family. Um, and uh, that, was, that was a very lonely existence for many, many years. Um, um. Sorry to take a second turn, but I was also mm -hmm. prompted by something you said, which was that your father died just a year ago. And of course, he asked you to write his story. Did he get a chance to read your book in manuscript, and how did he react? Well, you know, it's really interesting, because I, you know, when I had a readable manuscript, um, I, I presented it and said, uh, you know, it's ready, and you know the editor likes it, and and to which my father just said, "Oh, in this those drawn out Hungarian <laughs> files, oh, it's fantastic." Um, but then didn't you know didn't want to read it. Um, so um, and you know, and I've puzzled over that <laughs> a lot. Um, uh, you know, my father was. I mean, some months after that, my father began to become ill, and at that point, you know, I just think didn't, you know, kind of have the concentration or bandwidth to read much of anything, although she continued to, eat, you know, to the last days in the hospital, announcing to people, my daughter is about to publish a book on me. Um, but, um, yeah, so I think that what my father uh, wanted was, most of all, was to be perceived and it didn't, and you know, it was less important that um, that she vet the 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 final project than it was to feel that she somebody had seen, you know, had perceived her. Um, and you know, in a funny way, maybe you know, if it, what surprised me is that here's my father, who was sort of an obsessive Photoshopper before the days of Photoshop, always wanting to control and and. Um, edit uh, any any sort of image of, of herself and yet she let go of that and I think she must have made a decision early, 
early on in inviting me um, sort of back into her life to tell her story that that she was she wanted um, me to tell the story warts and all. I know she would often brag to people, well, my daughter, she's like, you know, she never pulls any punches when she's reporting. She's going to get to the bottom of this. So <laughs> I think that's, that's what she wanted. One, the one way. Okay. Um, I have a question, a two-parter. Um, you met your father, much, he was much older, and you had always known him as a man, as your father. Mm -hmm with a very stormy childhood, it sounds like. And right. Not a necessarily happy relationship from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, it's sort of a two-parter. I don't know what your father looked like. I don't know if he was a very masculine-looking person. Were you ever able, in all of your ongoing relationship with him until he died, able to, or not able, did you, perceive him as a woman at any point? Mm -hmm. Did it seem to you, this is my father pretending to be a woman? Pretending mm -hmm. is not exactly the right word, because if he's trans, he's trans. But right. was he, were you ever able to incorporate that, that this mm -hmm. really is a woman, mm -hmm. number one? And number two, were you able to, in any way, sort of reconcile what he had done to the entire family in your past mm -hmm. leading up to this? even though you, psychologically you can understand what his struggle was and mm -hmm. maybe that's why he was mm -hmm. the way he was. But were you <coughs> able to, did any of your feelings of your past sort of soften seeing <coughs> what his life had been mm -hmm. like leading up to this? Mm -hmm. Great, thanks, those are two good questions. Um, well, you know, my, my father's desire to be a woman was undeniable and I accepted that. Um, you know, I think actually much harder to deal with were you know, the ways my father held on to um, you know, the, who she used to be. Um, I, we certainly disagreed on what it um, being a woman meant, <laughs> um, and and. I certainly took issue with this, uh, you know, like oh, being a woman, according to my father, meant, you know, being in the kitchen and, um, or one of my father's favorite phrases early on was the dumb, you know, here I am being the dumb broad. Um, <laughs> and, um, I, and, or she would say, you know, you, I, you know, you just write, you write about the uh, disadvantages of being a woman, and I see only the advantages. So we had, you know, we had struggles over that. But I, you know, again, I mean, over the years, that became, that sort of, the whole argument receded. And, and I think because, you know, when you know somebody that long, you don't, anyone you know really long time, you, you're not seeing them in a category, you're seeing them as them with all you know, all the things that, that made them, of which gender is a part, but not, not everything. Um, um, you know, and, and as far as, I mean, dressing as a woman, all that, that just, I have to say that, I, I mean, I guess because it's sort of ephemeral, I mean, I didn't, or external anyway, that uh, that was something I just, there was a very quick adjustment period and um, on, on the second question about uh, the violence and how I dealt with that later I mean my father I, you know we finally sat down and talked about it um, and uh, toward the toward the end of my father's life, there was, and I talk about this in the book. Um, we were in the Orthodox synagogue where she, as uh, a child, would go, you know, went every Sabbath. Um, and my father started saying the, the blessing from parent to child. Uh, uh, over me as we were sitting there and then suddenly turned to me and said you know I was wrong what I did 
when um, referring to a violent moment that actually and that involved me hitting hitting my head against the floor, uh, and and I took that uh, as a sort of global apology for the many other um, uh, violent <laughs> and ugly moments of, of my childhood inflicted not just on me but on um, the rest of the family. Um, so it didn't exonerate <laughs> my father's behavior in any way. I was still certainly on my mother's side on on that. But um, we did get to a point, I mean, I mean, forgiveness is different than saying, oh, never mind, I forgot all about that. Um, and uh, she, I, I think, genuinely expressed contrition, um, and and I expressed um, deep regret for letting um, so many years go by without, you know, healing that breach between us. So. Did you want to go? I, to the extent that one finds, uh, you know, I mean, I'm not a big believer in closure and, you know, letting the healing begin, but I am deeply, uh, I feel deeply fortunate that I had all those years with my father um, and that we, you know, we came to really see each other and sort of see each other whole. And um, that's... Um, you know, that's wonderful. I, I mean, I think um, so many uh, so many of us as children see our parents' power and our, the power over us. And to be able to see um, a parent's frailties and vulnerabilities and to stop seeing them as a caricature and see them as fully human is, um, was a great gift for me that my father gave me. Thank you so much. No, oh, welcome to oh, good. Yes, Janetta. <laughs> Sister Susan. <laughs> In um, the interest of telling truths, not truth, but truths, <laughs> I want to first say that I am running for an office, <laughs> and I know that there's a lot of competition because I'm running for the position of president of the Susan Faludi fan club. <laughs> I was hoping you would say U.S. president. Um, Susan, it, it's really hard to find words because I'm so struck by your courage first of all, Thank you. just your sheer courage. And I'm anticipating what it's going to be like to struggle with you and through you in this book. One of the things that happened to me tonight in listening to these really amazing and really grace-filled readings was that I was taken back to a point in my <coughs> youth when I was a student at Oberlin College taking a course called Racial and Cultural Minorities taught by Simpson and Yinger. And I started to fixate on what Simpson and Yinger helped us, said the two beloved professors, to understand as the definition of a Jew. Someone who believed to be and publicly announced to be a Jew, and importantly, someone accepted as viewed by others to be a Jew. 
And in this struggle around multiple identities that we're all finally beginning to do and getting rid of singularities, there goes the black one, there goes the lesbian one, there goes the Jew, there goes the Muslim, it did strike me how basic that lesson was Mm. because your father declared his womanness, Mm. but it was meaningless until you, Susan, and Mm. others Mm. declared it with him. So I know this isn't really in the form of a question, Early on, I had a question. I said, <laughs> I'm going up with my question, but but this is more. This is more. I guess it is a question in the sense of seeking your affirmation mm-hmm. of this notion, which goes beyond your dad and you. Mm-hmm. It is that we humans really do require others. Mm-hmm to acknowledge who we are. And that becomes an important role that we can play Mm -hmm. in the lives of others. Yeah. So. Yes. I'm winning this this campaign. I'm going to be the president. (laughs) Thank you. And I I, I don't think I can add to that other than... um, to say yes, that uh, I, you know, I came over to get to the bottom of my father, um, but I think I was also sort of a uh, big reflecting mirror for my father, in which my father could finally find herself um, through my recognition of who who she was. So, thank you all so much for coming. So, Su- Susan's book.